Hey everybody, this is Perch. Let's talk about an underrated run of X-Force. Now, you might be thinking that Rick Remender run, but I, I, you can't call that underrated because a lot of people view that as uh, one of the best, uh, certainly the best modern uh, Marvel runs in, in quite a long time. Gave, gave it lots of space, uh, was able to complete kind of a full story. The story circled around to the conclusion and, and uh, had some really great stuff to it. Uh, that was that, that Rick Remender run. Really pretty incredible. And it was the run that kind of cemented his Marvel career, and it was also the run that generated a ton of jealousy uh, from former and current Marvel writers, uh, you know, that uh, went after him relentlessly and, and started uh, uh, kind of leaking and pushing stories out uh, around kind of various unfair aspects. We've covered that in other videos, but uh, it's I still need to go and do the full kind of Rick Remender story and, and kind of that, that screw job that happened there. But this is about a different run. So let's let the viewer uh, talk for themselves. They wrote in, it says, Hey Perch, I recently reread the criminally underrated X-Force volume three by Craig, by Craig Kyle and Chris Yost. It holds up so well and really shows that a lot of modern comics are missing. When you're reading an issue of this run, there are multiple plot threads going on throughout the same issue. Sometimes they're related, and sometimes it's a separate character plot. They did a great job drawing on past stories and characters while also expanding on the lore without retelling the same stories. The run is often overlooked because they had to hurriedly end the book to, so that Rick Remender could come in and ape some of their plots for his own overrated X-Force book. I did like the, X the Remender run, but anyway. But he added Deadpool, so I guess that's all you needed at the time. Um, it, what is true, I think, about that statement, I, I like the, the Remender run. I thought it brought its own new stuff to the, to the title. Um, but uh, it is true that uh, the uh, Kyle and uh, Yost run was kind of uh, accelerated to a conclusion that, that I don't believe the writers were ready for, or you know, they, they had other plans in mind, clearly, as they were setting things up. And then I also think that some of the elements that Remender run absolutely kind of regurgitated stuff that uh, Kyle and Yost did. So if you, if you have a chance, you should read that run. It's it's good fun, and and I think it does have a lot of good elements to it. Totally over, uh, totally agree with the multiple plots. And this is something that uh, I hear a lot of comic editors, not so much comic writers, uh, have worked pretty hard to kind of talk themselves out of having multiple plots going on in the book. Now, why would they do that? Well, the, the logic and the argument is, hey, new readers are coming into the book, and if you, you know, have too many subplots and things, and it discourages them. It, it, it makes them not want to read, which I think is a, a terrible, terrible logic and makes absolutely no sense and doesn't follow kind of any of what we've seen, I'm not just comics, but shows, movies, anything, hell, even the MCU, the, you know, you could make this argument of, hey, the the things at the end, the little uh, teasers or the little clues and Easter eggs that they put in, uh, those those scare away view movie viewers because you know maybe they haven't watched all the MCU movies, so this this would, uh, this kind of lore would, would uh, confuse and puzzle them. Uh, but clearly that's that's stupid and it doesn't make any sense. And I think those little teasers at the end of the movie, the you know the uh, extra little bits of plot is quite frankly a good. One of the key things that's made the MCU successful, people have gotten very hooked on those. Um, it's amazing. People, I, I hear people every now and then, they're like, oh, should we sit through the credits? There may be more movie. People are saying that in the new Top Gun. It's like, what, what do you think is going to happen? Like at the end of the new Top Gun, there's going to be a little post-credits spoiler where, uh, you know, Tom Cruise is walking around and suddenly Starscream comes in and goes, uh, you know, we need you for the war on Cybertron. Is that, like, <laughs> that'd be pretty awesome, actually. Anyway, sorry, let's get back to the mail. So uh, when I went online to see what Kyle and Yost were up to and what other comics they released, I was disappointed to see that there weren't very many. They appear to have gone to the movie and TV show side of the Marvel line, which I guess is the only way to make real money and get a check for Marvel these days. Yeah, well, I, I, you, don't even, you don't get a great check there either, uh, quite frankly, but anyway. The art is also leagues ahead of what we got today. They had two artists throughout the run. And this, this, this point, I think, is a clever one. Clayton Crane has a unique style that really worked with the darker tone of the series. Also, I'm not gay, but Crane's Warpath can absolutely get it. <laughs> so, sorry. The other art team of the book was Mike Choi with Sonio Obak coloring, and they put in God to your work. 
When I looked up the art teams, Crane seemed to be largely on cover work, and Mike Choi's Instagram listed stay-at-home dad still occasionally drawing comics, adjacent uh, professor at uh, UIW, which was really fucking heartbreaking to see that he's largely out of the industry. Birch, I know you often talk about writers and artists of the past from 70s, 80s, and even 90s who can't seem to find work in the industry. With industry insiders saying that their style is old-fashioned, but these are creators from a book that ran from 2008 to 2010. But I guess even that is too old for modern books, huh? Anyway, hope more people pick up this run. Um, more people should pick up the run. It's a good run. Uh, you can, I was going to say you could find it cheap. Not really, though. You could, you could find collected versions relatively cheap, but it's in that weird kind of middle ground where it's not old enough for it to be cheaper and it's not new enough for it to be completely, you know, quarter bin. So it's in that, it's in that weird middle ground, but you could, you could find it fairly easily. And it's, it's a, it's a good run. I think it's, it's enjoyable. You get a good story out. Um, yeah, sad to say, you know, I do often pick on, you know, writers and creators of the 70s and 80s, and mostly why my mind goes there is because these creators are uh, are definitely nearing the end of their career, just for health reasons and other things, and so it's like, you know, it, it would make a lot of sense to, you know, give them one more adventure, so we could have one more story out of some, you know, real legends in uh, comics. Uh, but the same thing holds true for people... I'd say if you were doing comics before 2015, you know, seven years ago, you have a decent chance of being, you know, ignored and rolled out of the industry. Um, or at least you, you know, there is that, well, you know, this style is a little dated. Now, um, you know, Kyle and Yost, uh, as writers, were seen as, uh, and, and this is the way they were described in some cases, as kind of throwbacks to kind of the simpler comics. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, simpler comics is sold, but, but definitely I, I've heard, you know, that kind of term thrown around for them. Um, same thing with the artists. The artists are seen as, uh, well, a style that doesn't really uh, hit with readers today. Again, who are these readers today? And, and more importantly, I, I mean, to accept that that premise is true, uh, what data are we looking at? What, what information? If we're looking at sales numbers, sales numbers are, are by and large lower. So what other data are we looking at? Because I hear that, you know, a decent amount from editors. When I'll ask about, say, a, you know, and, and going further back, a Walt Simonson, I'll hear, well, you know, readers today don't really, really resonate with that art style. How do you know that? Who are you talking to? Are you, I'm, I'm honestly curious. Is it who, how in the world? And I can't find any data to support some of the arguments that they have. Uh, and somebody suggested once, it's like, well, maybe they're just looking at Instagram follower accounts. Not really, because several of the artists that, you know, are, are you know, in comics today, I have a higher Instagram or Twitter account, uh, follower account than these guys. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what, what metrics are we looking at to suggest that this, this current artist we're putting on this book has a huge following. Uh, but these artists, uh, you know, Mike Choi, who's a great artist, is well, you know, he's he he doesn't really fit with today's uh, today's creators or today's customers. I, I, who, again, how? Who are you looking at? What are you seeing? Would love to know. Um, I yeah, it, it, definitely. There's a lot of creators in the 2000 to 2012 kind of time frame that are just gone. From comics, and several have gone into movies. Several have gone into education, to gaming, all kinds of different fields. But they've they've largely left comics, and it, it has left this void. And maybe that'd be a good video series of, you know, we talk about the '80s and '90s, but let's just look uh, 15 years ago. Where are a lot of these people? And it's it's remarkable how many people are are just gone. Um, and so you speculate, you know, five, ten years from now, what's going to happen? My, my, my theory is, because I can argue this two ways, either, you know, the industry is going to continue to shape and evolve and we're going to get that big major shift that we've been expecting and, and waiting for, where the comic industry, you know, resets, if you will. Or uh, I think you're going to see, you know, the audience kind of dwindle 
And so the people who are doing comics today are still going to be doing comics five years from now because it's it's largely so unappealing. It's not bringing in new people. It's it's this the current creators have just consolidated further down to a core group who you know aren't making any money or living off GoFundmes and those are the people making comics. So it's a, it's like one or the other is going to happen. I still bet more on the first that we are going to get the true reset. Because there is enough evidence that you can make money in comics and you can it can be a, a seller and people will buy comics that, you know, enough business minded people will come together and say, hey, we can't completely, you know, ignore this and let it just you know, do whatever it wants to do because there's too much money to be made here. We're leaving money on the table if we ignore it. I do believe that moment comes. Uh, but anyway, this is a good run. Uh, I definitely would would recommend it. it had some some good comic action. It, de- it, it did read in some ways, like the story structures of the 80s and 90s. You had subplots, you had villains, you had a lot... I mean, you had a lot going on in that run. Um, a lot of spitting plates that were were good and, and did some interesting character development and advanced things in a, in a really clever way. I thought it was, was really solid. Um, it, you know, it's a shame, and this is probably a video for another time, but there's this Young Justice Dark Crisis book out right now where basically the plot is that Mr. Mitzelplik's son has taken, uh, you know, the super bo- Superboy, uh, Tim Drake Robin, and um, uh, Impulse, uh, Connor Kent, Superboy. Uh, and they've sent, he sent them back into this fake past, which is the 90s. And they're having adventures there. And uh, but, but the writing, you know, everybody get, got hung up on this one panel where Batman said that Tim Drake was just going through a phase and, you know, and they, they went all over that. Uh, but the rest of the comic is is blatantly offensive. And what I mean by offensive is it, it states pretty aggressively that all the comics in the 90s are racist, homophobic, sexist, just trash. And, I mean, it's it's like you, you might go, oh, you know, where does it infer that? They, the characters say that out loud. Like, it's written. And it, it, is, a, it is a painful, painful comic that is uh, pretty much at every turn decides to shit on Peter David and what he did and these, these comics. And I'm, I'm amazed DC published it. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, if it's, it's weird. People are saying the quiet part out loud now where it is, uh, you, you, you know, there was always this, uh, this almost phony, we stand on the shoulders of giants. But when you talk to a lot of creators, uh, kind of modern creators, um, privately, you know, they would say things like, well, a lot of those old comics are pretty racist. You know, they wouldn't say it out loud because, uh, you know, you're working for these companies and that might get you, get you to trouble, but they're, they're not hiding and they're publishing comics for saying this. This is pretty baffling. Um, the, the lack of respect for the past in comics continues to be, you know, one of the things that irks me like no other, but anyway, thank you very much for the mail. Thanks for the question, and definitely thanks for the recommendation. Go check out the second volume of X-Force. Thanks for listening.